All right, if I could have your attention, please. Thank you so much for coming. This is a great crowd on a Friday afternoon, the day before the holiday weekend, which is a testament, I think, to Assistant Attorney General Carlin. Um, I'm going to do not much more than turn it over to Professors Vitrine and John Carlin. Again, thanks so much for coming. And uh, with no further ado. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you all for coming out on a beautiful Friday afternoon for this. Uh, the zeroth thing to say, um, uh, possibly fitting, is that this is being recorded, uh, not live streamed, but from this moment onward, uh, a record is being preserved and uh, will be uh, sent to the Harvard Law School Library for indexing and also put on the web for everyone else. So um, be aware of that. Uh, I'm so delighted, John, that you're uh, willing to join us today uh, for a chat. Um, I guess uh, first let me just say uh, quickly, I'm Jonathan Citrin. I teach internet law here at Harvard Law School. Uh, I am also a member of the board of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and a member of something called the NSA Advisory Board. So I have been uh, somewhat immersed in some of these issues from what you'd call multiple perspectives. Um, and uh, John, you are an HLS grad, is that right? Yes, and it's, uh, it's great to be back on campus when I was a uh a student here, there was, uh, there was not a keen interest in national security law, uh, nor was it uh, in the 90s a, an available curriculum or set of, set of courses. And so uh, I came back here uh, a little while ago, I'd say five years ago or six years, and was shocked at the number of courses and at the amount of interest in this field, which really has developed since that time. And when you were here, did you know you wanted to be a prosecutor? Was that sort of what you had your eye on? Looking around and seeing some familiar, uh, some familiar faces. So when I was here, um, and I think the, the programs that you have in place now that allow you to pursue an interest in public interest or in federal government work are fantastic. Uh, when I was here, they weren't as well uh, developed. And so I was in the first class of what's called the uh, Heyman Fellowship and was very thankful that it arrived just in time uh, for me. And I did know I was interested in going into federal government work, and particularly that I was interested in prosecution. When I was a student here, I did the Harvard Defenders Clinic. Show of hands, is anyone doing that here now? Interesting, maybe no overlap with national security law. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and became very interested there in some of the criminal justice And that uh, was because issues. you were interested in defense work, or you thought it'd be good to see that angle before going into prosecution? Uh, no, I was interested in criminal, uh, in criminal law, yes. in the criminal justice system, and particularly uh, I knew that I very much wanted to be in a courtroom and try cases, and I was certain that I'd be going back to New York to do it. It's been uh, around 15 years, and I never made, it, never, made it back to, uh, never made it back to New York. So just give us a quick thumbnail sketch of what you did after graduating then. So uh, after graduating, I went into the Department of Justice through the honors program, and Phil Hyman uh, was very helpful at the time, uh, who I know is still teaching here. I just met with him at suggesting, hey, if you want to get into court quickly and you're interested in these types of issues, you might want to consider the criminal tax division. So I applied to criminal tax, at which point I had not taken tax. Mm. So I took that second mm -hmm. semester of my third year um, and joined the criminal tax division. And I went on a series of details. Uh, so these are assignments where you're ostensibly on the books of the Criminal Tax Division, but you end up working at other places in the Department of Justice. And I went to the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office and prosecuted domestic violence cases, and particularly cases involving uh, children, and then went to Tucson, Arizona, which at that point they had closed the border down in San Diego. Tucson was a sleepy office. The New York City of, of that area of Arizona. Well, it forced me to learn to drive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I had not been out to that region before. I had a great time. Actually, I went out with a bunch of other lifelong Northeasterners, and I was the only one who, uh, who came back. Uh, and then, <laughs> they're, they're, still they're still there. there. Yeah, okay, yeah. just to be clear. <laughs> that was the question R on everyone's mind. Rattlesnake. Yeah. Didn't. No, they're still there and enjoy, enjoy life. In fact, one just became a judge. Uh, and then uh, returned to the D.C. area. Actually did do a criminal tax case, including uh, trying one in the Boston uh, courthouse. And then went permanently to the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, where I did what are traditionally local crimes, but are through a federal office uh, in D.C. 
uh, including homicides and uh, sex offense and domestic violence related homicides. And then moved to the federal side of the house, did fraud and public corruption cases, uh, defense contractor fraud, and began specializing in an area of computer hacking and intellectual property crimes. Which Growth industry, terrible. I understand. Yes, apparently so. You can get tenure with it, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Good for one train only. One train only. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, so uh, I became, it has a terrible name too, the, the CHIP program, but there were no short shorts uh, and the like. And I went from there to... That was the, an old reference. Old reference. To the, for, <laughs> there for those following along on Wikipedia, that was chips with uh, <laughs> Ponch and John. That's yes. right. And the person whose fault it was, was the, uh, at that point, the U.S. attorney out in San Francisco, Bob Mueller, who later became the, the director of FBI, did the first chip program, and presumably, uh, knowing him, had no idea yes. that there was a television <laughs> show uh, with that name. But uh, I went from there to Maine Justice to coordinate that program uh, nationally on technology issues. And then, uh, and every step along the way, except the switch to the U.S. Attorney's Office, I'm doing these different things on details. Uh, and then I went over to the FBI to be counsel to uh, Bob Mueller and when he was director and then later as chief of staff. And from there... So what year would that have been around, just so we're straight... 2007. 2007, okay. Um, and I was at the FBI from 2007 to 2011, so okay. four years uh, with him. And his uh, tenure got uh, unexpectedly extended in 2011, and so I left uh, right after he got uh, confirmed to do the extra two years. Uh, the statute was passed that he could do the extra two years, and went to the National Security Division, which uh, did not exist. It's a brand new division. Here. Yeah, first new litigating division of the department in about 50 years and it was created in 2006. Got it. Wonderful. So I know you have a few remarks you want to give. Uh, so we're going to hear from John and then uh, John and I are going to talk a little bit and then we're going to open it up uh, for questions and comments. I've been given to understand that there is a question tool, Kira, do you want to talk about that? So We have masks in the corner. <laughs> uh, not exactly, but we do Good. have um, an online question tool where you can log in, post a question, and we'll pass it along. Um, so I will write the URL up on the board. Uh, so you, can you can visit if you like. If you don't, you can still ask a question the old-fashioned exactly. way. And uh, I don't know if a hashtag has been established, but no, we'll let the collectivity decide on that. Uh, a final, just logistical note, is it only me, or is it like 90 degrees in here? I it's thought hot. you were sweating me. <laughs> no, exactly. Oh, right. <laughs> we're going to break them. Uh, so uh, we're going to, um, uh, if you see me on my phone, it means we're talking to the authorities to see if this beautifully overbuilt structure, um, with great thanks to Justice Kagan, um, can be... Uh, having some air conditioning. Is the, uh, the facilities have improved a little bit since I was uh, <laughs> here. It doesn't seem fair. For instance, you don't keep public interest in the closet anymore, which mm. I think is the, the space mm. that allotted was in the previous, uh, in the 90s. Indeed. Um, uh, so, I, I did have a student, yeah. uh, a prospective student come to me at one point recently who said, uh, okay, I know that Harvard Law School does public interest, but how is it in corporate law? I was like, wow, <laughs> that, is a, uh, that is a flip. So um, times have is, indeed yes. uh, evolved. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, uh, cede the floor to you for a bit. You can stand at the podium or stay where you are and We're good here. go to town. What I thought I'd do is just give an overview of the National Security Division, uh, what it is, how it was created, and what's a top priority now. So as I said, the uh, National Security Division was created in 2006, and it was one of the later 9-11 related reforms, and it came out of a commission called the WMD Commission. You may be wondering what it had to do with uh, weapons of mass destruction, and so are we. Uh, but it was a good recommendation buried in that uh, report. Uh, Judge Silberman was one of the chairs and was very familiar with the workings of the Department of Justice. And it was really a common sense reform insofar as prior to the creation of the division, the terrorist prosecutors reported through one chain in the criminal division. The counterintelligence or counterespionage prosecutors reported through a different chain 
and the intelligence lawyers reported through yet a third chain. And so there were three different chains. And the people responsible for each of those uh, sections had many other responsibilities on their plate at the time. And so the idea was pre-9-11, there had been a wall, uh, most of you have heard about, where there were certain legal and cultural prohibitions to the sharing of law enforcement information with intelligence agencies and vice versa, intel agencies to law enforcement. And so certain legal reforms were put in place to allow the sharing of that information. And I'd put this reform more in the context of a cultural reform. The idea is you should have the criminal prosecutors and the intelligence lawyers sitting side by side under one chain reporting to one uh, official who would see this full scope of the activity to ensure that information was shared and that people work together day in and day out on what we sometimes call an all tools approach. And the idea there is that the criminal justice system is a tool that you can use to disrupt the threat, but you should be focused on what the threats are, who are the threat actors, who are the terrorists and what do they want to do, who are the nation state actors and what do they want to do, and then look to see what are the legally available tools to prevent them from doing what it is that they want to do. And so the criminal justice system might be one tool to do that, but it might be a treasury uh, designation. It might be a commerce uh, designation or uh, use of related sanctions provisions. It might be prosecution by uh, another country outside of the United States, a European partner. It might be State uh, Department diplomatic uh, efforts that prevent the threat. It might be a regulatory or civil reform. But we should be looking at the available intelligence, be driven by that intelligence to prioritize resources against the threat, and then work to stop the threat. And I think our structure, uh, in addition to that, allowed for a one point of contact between the Department of Justice and all of the 16 uh, elements of the intelligence community, and also allowed for the Department of Justice to sit at the table in a more concentrated way during National Security Council deliberations, where the person in my chair often sits. Um, they call the process, it's three tiers usually, and there are some tiers below in National Security Council, but it'll be assistant secretary level meetings, the names have changed, uh, but interagency policy councils, deputy committee meetings, and those will be the relevant deputy secretaries in theory, and principals meeting, which essentially is a cabinet meeting, but in the space of those who are in the national security space. And then they sometimes call those national security council meetings when they're chaired by the president. So <clears throat> with this position, uh, the Assistant Attorney General for National Security usually attends those meetings at the deputy level, alternating with the deputy uh, Attorney General, and then we staff, uh, you know, as appropriate, other aspects of the National Security Council. And that's where a lot of the interagency, if you're going to do an all-tools approach, you need to make sure that all the relevant agencies are discussing and sharing information and deciding what the best policy is to uh, prevent a threat. And with our structure, we're able to more regularly participate in those conversations and thus weigh in not just uh, with our legal voice, whether okay. something is or is not permissible, but in the policy arena too, whether something is or is not desirable. And I think it's also helpful insofar as the intelligence community and the Department of Defense speak what can seem like a different language if you are trained in a lawyer and Department of Justice. Uh, acronyms and just ways of speaking about what it is that they do. And it's helpful to have folks at the department who are used to that uh, and have an understanding of what it means and vice versa. Uh, as, as you guys are slowly being warped into speaking, uh, lawyers speak in a certain way as well. And that is true at the Department of Justice. And so uh, being sure you be able to translate what it is that the lawyers are saying in a way that's going to reach the uh, operator's ears. And so National Security Division is serving as a one-stop shop on those types of issues. And I'll give a little overview of what we're uh, doing. First priority is going to be uh, preventing a terrorist attack inside the United States and, that, uh, and against United States persons overseas. That is and will remain uh, a top priority. And right now, it's very much, uh, again, in the news. And that may mean by uh, overseeing the prosecution of those cases, 
um, can't really take a significant step on an international terrorism prosecution uh, under the, one of the relevant statutes without getting permission from the National Security Division. And the reason for that was a uh, desire to have uniformity and to make sure you are doing that, that balance to make sure that the criminal system is the, is the right way to be proceeding in the case and that you're protecting intelligence sources and methods. But in addition to prosecution, I also have a group that I wanted to highlight given what's going on uh, lately. A couple of weeks ago, I was with the, uh, the president in New York for the UN-related meetings where the president chaired a security council meeting that had a unanimous resolution on combating the foreign terrorist fighter threat. It's a threat that there are over at this point uh, 12,000 foreign fighters in the Syria-Iraq region. They come from uh, countries throughout the world and it's the type of problem that to stop it is going to take an international coalition. And in terms of even numbers alone, I wouldn't say that the United States is at the top of that uh, threat pyramid and so many of our partners uh, abroad are very concerned about this threat and wondering what they can do to prevent it. One of those uh, tasks, there's a side meeting that I went to of 29 countries um, represented by the folks that handle terrorism related issues called the Global Counterterrorism Forum and consistent with the all tools approach that I was discussing, we worked through that forum to see what are best practices that both balance civil rights and civil liberties on the one hand and work within a rule of law, but on the other hand provide effective tools to use the legal systems of our respective country partners to prosecute would-be foreign terrorist fighters. And so we adopted a second memorandum there of best practices and in the Security Council resolution also uh, demanded that countries work to put those practices into their respective uh, laws. And so that's part of that all tools approach is building that infrastructure in other countries and working with them, learning lessons uh, from them as well. Uh, so those are two priority initiatives on the terrorism side of the house. A third that you've heard discussed is the countering violent extremism. And there uh, the idea is that its success would be catching uh, some of these individuals before they hit either the criminal justice system and certainly before they commit a terrorist act. And in over 80% of these cases, according to one study, there have been someone who's in a position to watch someone getting radicalized um, and in a type of position where they could intervene. And in those cases, to encourage those people to take steps to, uh, to intervene. It within the community before it ever hits the criminal justice system. On the intel side of the house, there's a couple of different programs. One is the counter proliferation or export control programs consistent with the all tools approach. This is the idea of let's work as a nation to put in regulations with our international partners that prevent the sale in particular of weapons of mass destruction technology to either rogue regimes or terrorist groups. And we both work with them in terms of doing the legal vetting for, uh, for instance, treasury designations, but also when someone violates the relevant export uh, control regime or designation to bring appropriate criminal charges. One area I wanted to highlight for this group and the Berkman Center is when it comes to national security cyber threats, by which I mean threats from terrorist groups or nation states, we're trying to apply a similar approach to what we've done in terrorism, by which I mean on the terrorist arena in every U.S. attorney's office across the country, there are prosecutors specially trained on handling sensitive sources and methods, and the FBI um, has issued an edict that says you shall share your intelligence files with those prosecutors. It may be in 95% of those cases it doesn't result in a criminal charge, but you want to have that option uh, available for when you need it, and you also may need to use the criminal justice system to obtain evidence or take certain investigative steps. On the cyber side of the house, when it came to nation state actors and terrorist groups, we were not applying the same approach. And when you consider how technology has changed and that the division was first founded up really focused on that terrorism threat, I think it makes sense that it wasn't the key focus when they first started. But with my background and having worked with the FBI, as it transformed to try to meet the cyber threat, it was a noticeable gap when I came back over to the National Security Division. 
So we've tried to apply a similar model in that we created a network of people trained on the bits and the bytes and the particularities of seizing electric evidence on the one hand, electronic evidence on the other hand, on the one hand, and on the other hand, those who are used to handling sensitive sources and methods and familiar with reviewing the intelligence picture. That new network, which also has a terrible acronym, NISCUS, uh, the National Security Cyber Specialist. I think not as bad as CHIPS, but maybe also less memorable. Yeah, it's a small program, Meniscus. Meniscus, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting on the train. The, um, uh, and so we just started, launched that program in 2012, and simultaneously the FBI then issued a similar edict like they had in terrorism that said what was formerly on the intel side of the house now is going to be shared with these prosecutors. And as someone who used to do these cases criminally, I remember when I was at the FBI, there was a literal locked door, or it was not a wall, it was a locked door. But when it turned out to be a nation state actor and I was working the case, it went to an FBI squad on the other side of that door that was different than the squad I worked with, and I never saw it again, which was fine because there was enough to do on the criminal side, but I think didn't long term make sense. And so with that new approach of looking to see whether there is a criminal option in some of these cases, I think it led directly to the case that some of you may be familiar with in Pittsburgh, where for the first time uh, we brought criminal charges against five members of the People's Liberation Army, Unit 61398, for economic espionage that really cut across uh, American industry from nuclear to solar um, to steel. And that was activity that was really, it was espionage, economic espionage, but really it was theft. And what they were doing was steal, stealing information for profit. Uh, it was clearly being stolen um, for use by economic competitors with the private companies here in the United States. And I think for too long, uh, we had essentially decriminalized that activity because we weren't looking to see whether or not we could bring criminal cases. So while that's the first case, I don't think it'll be the last in this regard. Uh, some folks thought you could never figure out who was behind the keyboard, and we've shown that you can. They're not the easiest cases, but when the facts and evidence lead to someone behind the keyboard, we're going to bring charges. And that was part of an all-tools approach to try to change the behavior of the actors and ultimately hope create a norm that says it's not acceptable to steal information from private companies for economic gain. And that, that's a similar approach. It took years to establish the norm that we applied in the counter proliferation, proliferation uh, regime. And now it's accepted among our partner uh, countries. That, that too is a norm that you don't violate. And if you do, it can lead to criminal sanctions. I think I'll stop there and open it up to questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, John. Um, a lot of what you focused on was the uh, walls, locked doors, and lack of same between law enforcement and intelligence sides of the house. And I just wanted to ask a couple questions to elucidate that a little further. One example might be you could see the stereotypical intelligence gathering side of uh, uh, the government in a place where it's getting a lot of information about an adversary and learning a ton and maybe there's prosecutable stuff happening, but it feels like, no, no, let's, let's leave our sources intact if we do something as noisy as launching a prosecution. I mean, it's even same on the law enforcement side. Mm -hmm. you know, when do you spring a trap if you're gonna spring it? So I'm curious, do you see conflict between those who might see the intelligence value of just listening and being aware and being in there versus when you want to actually spring the so-called trap, which might sever the intelligence, but then bring somebody into the courtroom? Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's what <laughs> I, <didn't>, I <laughs> hadn't realized it was a yes, no question. <laughs> uh, there, there is absolutely a tension uh, 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 between the two. And day in, day out, uh, that's the work of many of the attorneys in the National Security Division who stand, as I was describing, as a bridge between the world of law enforcement and criminal justice and the intelligence community. And they're not, there is no easy answer. They're very fact um, specific uh, decisions and they rely on having a sense of what that overall intelligence picture is about the nature of the threat and when, uh, where, and how can you use the criminal justice system to achieve your strategic goal of diminishing the threat, and they're very, so that 
That's and the just letter. walk us yeah. through, how would a real conflict and a difference of opinion that just can't be resolved by talking it through, where does the rubber meet the road? Does it get escalated up to, I don't know, some kind of decision maker? Who, who thinks we that can. through? And let me divide it out a little bit. So the decision as to whether or not uh, there's sufficient evidence to bring a criminal charge and whether you've met your ethical obligations and your obligations under the U.S. Attorney's Manual, that is the Attorney General's um, decision. I think it's important that the Department of Justice stay independent in making that analysis, and there's been a long uh, historical tradition of the independence of the Department of Justice on those criminal justice decisions. But that's different. Um, deciding that you have sufficient evidence is different than necessarily using the tool, and it can come up in different contexts. One, for individuals located outside the United States, they'll be uh, particularly terrorists. They'll be uh, often a National Security Council group that meets, and it has all of the relevant agencies from Department of Defense to State to Treasury in the world that, that we uh, live in um, to others. And uh, we'll share the information, what's the complete portrait that we have of this individual or group, and then Sometimes we'll literally go around the table to see who has what option um, that they could suggest. And so someone might say, we have a good relationship with uh, X country in Europe, and we think we've talked to them, and they may have an available charge. And at Justice, we may say, um, we have an, uh, in these days, you call it an Article Three option, but a criminal option uh, that we could bring to the table. Or we don't, uh, as is sometimes the case. You know, and then with all of that, armed with that information through the National Security Council process, decide as to how to affect that operation. And I think you've seen in some of the uh, successes that we've had, it's, it's multiple prongs of the government even to bring someone back to a criminal justice system. So it might be, um, saw recently the conviction of the spokesman for Al Qaeda, who was with bin Laden right after 9-11 in New York. That took years and years to accomplish and work of intelligence community in order to track the individual State Department to work with countries to see uh, where he was and how we could obtain him, law enforcement to bring him back to the United States, and prosecutors, once he arrived in the United States, to prosecute him within nine months of uh, having arrived here through the criminal justice system. And you've seen it also um, with Al Libby uh, in Libya. Uh, being captured by members of the military and brought to a U.S. courtroom, and Abu Qatala, uh, one of the uh, allegedly one of the perpetrators of the Benghazi attack, who's uh, facing pending charges in the District of Columbia. So, in in those instances, you can yeah. see how it's multiple prongs, even when you're when what you're choosing is the criminal justice system. Now, something else you mentioned in your answer was years and years. These things don't happen overnight. I guess on television, the commercial break represents years and years of development, and when we right. come back, it's dun, dun. in court. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, which means that there may be a pipeline of cases only now starting to happen that are fruit of this era you're talking about, about increased sharing and cooperation between law enforcement and intelligence. And I, I wonder how, if I put on the Harvard Defender's hat for a second, if I'm defending somebody uh, for which an indictment has been brought, there's going to be a trial, there's, I'd want to know, all right, what evidence is there against the client? Where has it come from? And where can I probe for either uh, a substantive lack of, of evidence or some misstep in the development that represents like a Miranda rule, some other kind of exclusionary uh, thing I can invoke. And all of that would point to, to the extent that in a criminal case, what's being brought to bear as evidence, either at trial or in the path of developing what was needed to get the indictment and get to trial, if that's coming from the intelligence side of the house, what's your sense of how much that fact is and should be disclosed and made vulnerable to probing by the defense? Or is it sort of just look, here's the evidence, we can't tell you exactly where it came from. Uh, how, how do you think through those issues? So I think there's a, a carefully uh, tailored set of statutes in this regard, and the floor is obviously constitutional. Um, and you need to preserve uh, the rights of individuals to have a fair trial and be able to effectively confront the evidence against them. And the answer sometimes is that we are unable to do that while protecting the sensitive sources and methods, and so we do not have a criminal justice system option in that case. But often, um, 
and not always, because that really uh, uh, is uh, the answer at times. It will be uh, through a variety of legal mechanisms. So one would be the SEPA, Classified in Information uh, Procedures Act, and that provides a mechanism to provide the defense the information, <laughs> bless you, um, that they need with court supervision in order to effectively amount, uh, uh, to effectively put on a defense, while at the same time working to protect, uh, as you can, those sensitive sources and methods that are not necessary uh, to mount that the uh, defense, and provides a mechanism for a judge to review that information and make appropriate rulings, as they do with other <coughs> discovery issues. You also have portions of the FISA Act. Um, that provide for notice in ex parte uh, in camera litigation uh, to review whether or not the evidence was obtained originally in a lawful manner and whether there's an appropriate um, constitutional challenge to how it was obtained. And sometimes uh, you could, uh, sometimes it will result in a, in a ruling and the judge will say, you know, X sensitive source or method that intelligence community has classified needs to be shared in order to bring the case, and sometimes they'll decide it's worth it, um, given the, um, despite the loss of the, as you, as you put it, despite the loss yes. of being able to gain intelligence that way, and sometimes we can't. Now, the headline from which we could rip that, that people may have seen, uh, I forget if it was the Post or the Times, had an article in particular about the Drug Enforcement uh, uh, Agency and parallel construction. I'm not sure... Uh, any of us quite well understands the term, and so maybe we should just play word association. If I say DEA parallel construction, what does it make you think of? The criminal division. <laughs> <laughs> not national security division, <laughs> not my table. Uh, well, I'm just doing word association. <laughs> um, but I could talk about it in general. Yeah, uh, sure. Without uh, reference to the DEA or on the criminal side. But it may be that... Um, this, this is true outside of the context of national security law and was true when I was a criminal prosecutor as well when you might want to protect, for instance, a confidential uh, informant. And when I was starting out, that was a particular problem in D.C. because you were seeing a lot of cooperating witnesses get targeted for violence in their uh, neighborhoods and a lot of uh, uh, families were afraid to come forward unless you could figure out a way to protect them against retaliation for participating in the criminal justice system. And so what you would look to see in those instances and others is what led you towards the evidence that you are going to use or, uh, against a criminal defendant in trial. If you were to reconstruct how you got there, um, how was it if you obtained certain evidence for other purposes, um, or other intelligence for other purposes, was it really relevant to you bringing your criminal case? And the idea being that if you're predicated on a particular piece of information, then it probably is going to trigger uh, discovery and notice uh, issues, and there needs to be a right to challenge it. If you built your case uh, without that information, then you won't. And so that's, that's a pretty common um, phenomenon throughout the, the criminal law, and it obviously has some, would have some applicability in national security. So another way to look, or, or another time that comes up all the time that uh, some of you folks may be familiar with is when the civil and criminal systems uh, overlap. And um, so it may be in the context of a civil inf investigation, somebody provided information that would be compelled because uh, they had to provide it in the civil context. If you were doing that as kind of a pretext for a criminal, for the criminal investigation, you wouldn't be able to use that information in your criminal case, and you'd have to show that the evidence that you got in your criminal case was not derived from the information that was obtained in that civil case. Uh -huh. uh, one last question on law enforcement and intel, and then I think we should throw it open. And that is, uh, I guess in the law enforcement context, we tend to know the tools at the disposal of police departments and the FBI, whether through television or otherwise, we, we know how they go about what they do. And we also tend to know the contours of protection um, that uh, the Supreme Court might articulate or the legislature might pass for, um, this will test my recollection of first year criminal law, but the difference in protection level among glove compartment under the seat and trunk 
My recollection is if you've got something terrible you don't want the police to see, the trunk is where it should go. That's where you have the best. <laughs> it's news you can use uh, from this. Uh, am I right about that? That, that, uh, that used to be the, uh, the case law that was most protective of the trunk because it was out of the reach of the person who... Uh, right, right. Yeah, Not anymore? Concerned. Well, it depends on what type of um, evidence, because I think when it comes to digital evidence, such as a cell phone, there's been a recent... Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yep. So <laughs> I thought you were going to say, you well, since the introduction of the hatchback, it got right. very complicated. complicated. <laughs> but um, I guess uh, that's an example, though, of the fact that the rule the court articulates is done in a public opinion and allows advisors to crooks as well as advisors to innocent people to say what I just said without fear of aiding and abetting or whatever it may be, the fact that it's known what the contours of the tool set are and the legal limits are can help the bad folks. And I'm wondering, given that there are no doubt a lot of people um, uh, in the wake of the Snowden leaks and such, feeling like there was a whole scope to surveillance that had not been publicly disclosed or talked about. There was just Ron Wyden wiggling his ears every so often. Um, what's your sense structurally about the propriety, how much the either legal limits that have been articulated and are being absorbed, how much should those legal limits be publicized and known, and how much should the toolkit be known? Or is keeping the tool itself or the activity itself uh, a secret something really important for the kind of work you're doing? Uh, so it's a good question. There's a, lot, uh, there's a lot in there. So let's start with what is clearly the most important part of your question, what's on television? And I, and I think it's an important <laughs> point here. I know when I was trying jury trials, um, there was a show that is still on the air, but I don't know how popular it is now, CSI. And there was a period of time where we talked about the CSI effect. And actually, how many of you, uh, I guess he's retired, huh? So I had Alan Dershowitz for my uh, criminal Please, law. Please, emeritus. Emeritus. Yes. I think he always called himself that. <laughs> uh, and had the uh, pleasure of working for him uh, for a bit. But he, he would always uh, say that before you did a trial, that the best thing to do would be to watch TV that night and see what's on TV, because that's, that's what's going to be on the minds of your jurors, and that's how you should be presenting your case. And there was a phenomenon later where uh, I, I believed in the truth of his words called the CSI effect, where when you'd be presenting to juries, they had such a false expectation as to what it is that the police could do and what the available tools and techniques were, that if you did not, you had to address it. And many uh, prosecutors started addressing it directly in the opening statement to say, this is not CSI. And you are not going to see a video reconstruction of the crime at the end of this. <laughs> uh, at the end of this trial. And so I think right now we're in a similar, uh, just uh, if you do a quick popular cultural survey of how the NSA and the intelligence community are portrayed, ranging from Homeland to The Good Wife to uh, Enemy of the State, Enemy Oldie of but the a goodie. State, Damages, uh, pretty much Battle every Star show. Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> <laughs> Predates, but yes. <laughs> But in, yeah. in almost every one of these shows, there is A, the government knows absolutely everything and is listening to all content all of the time, and B, without any supervision, CIA and NSA are operating as operators inside the United States and using that information against US persons constantly. Um, and you'll see that in polling uh, data. And believe it or not, it's, uh, the overwhelming majority of people think that is currently the case, that you, can, that you can, without legal regulation, that people are looking at US person content um, all the time. And, uh, and two, about half the people are OK with that. Um, so there's, it, it's still a split issue, but that's what everyone assumes is happening, whichever side of, of the issue that you're on. So that I can uh, tell you from my experience. And I, there are those out there who could say that you don't know what you don't know. But, uh, that's not, it's not the case. And so I, I think there is a very, the intelligence regime and national security regime is set up uh, to do intelligence first. And I'm giving you some sense of the fact there's always an argument whether you want to use it at all in the criminal system because they want to keep gathering the intelligence. They don't want to reveal how uh, they're gathering. And every time it's used publicly in any context or another, you're giving people some indication of what you know and how. Um, <coughs> You know it. So their incentives tend to be in that 
direction with an understanding at the end of the day that like everyone working in the system, they want to prevent uh, the attack, but there's still an institutional uh, bias towards keeping it held. On the uh, criminal side of the house, if you're going to use it, you have to provide um, a appropriate uh, notice and allow it to be litigated and the mere fact sometimes that you're able to know what you know, even if you don't say how you know it, indicates uh, how it is that you know it and so d damages the ability to do intelligence collection. It's a constant uh, balancing act. I would, I do agree that whenever possible we should try to make as clear as we can what the legal framework or parameters are. That becomes particularly difficult in complex technical uh, opinions and because they're so integrally intertwined with the technology that's being used and how it's being used in the legal reasoning that it's hard to, to explain how the judge reached what they did without exposing the technique. And that has been, uh, that's a difficult and will be a continually difficult issue and it's a policy trade-off at the end of the day. And as many of you may have studied, there's a regime that's been in place for, uh, since the church committee report for good reason to prevent potential uh, abuse of these authorities and it set up a, a really American approach to the problem and that it involved all three branches of government. And what they did was they said, look, we get um, since time immemorial that there are national security needs and there's certain information that we need to keep secret to protect how it is that we're collecting it and make sure we can collect it in the future. And to conduct oversight, we're gonna set up a regime that involves the same judges that you appear before in criminal and civil cases, the FISA court judges. They're called a secret court, but they're not secret, and it wasn't secret before, who those judges were, uh, where they sat on their uh, day jobs. And they are to look at information that's uh, classified and rule um, you know, pursuant to the statute as to whether or not you are, the method in which you're acquiring it, it's particularly designed to protect the rights of US persons is appropriate. And then they set up a special uh, committees in the, in the Senate and the House, the select committees, intelligence committees, where representative members from both parties would be kept currently and fully informed and conduct oversight of that uh, system. So you had the legislative, you had the, uh, the court system on what almost every other country in the world treats as an executive branch function. And I think what you're seeing now is a healthy and good debate about whether that contour was sufficient. And you, and you could have a process that you agree with and not always agree with the result and want to uh, tinker around um, the edges and say that it reached X, Y, or Z wrong policy result. But there has been a protective process in place since that church committee. Got it. Let me open it up. Uh, I'm going to grab a microphone. Here I can help wrangle. Yes. Feel free to say who you are since probably we know anyway. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a 1L here. I was just working at the Buffer Center for the last two years over at the Kennedy School. One of the things I'm sort of interested in is, you, based on the factors you mentioned, pushing against enforcement of uh, indictments of, of, for cybercrime, you know, concerns about revealing sources of uh, methods, uh, difficulty of tracking things back. It seems as though it's like these things are likely to be under enforced into the future, even if we do see more indictments. In this climate, a lot of people have talked about hacking back of American companies basically doing self-protection, gathering information on their hackers, even trying to destroy their ha the attackers' computers. My question is, regardless of what you think about the wisdom of allowing this sort of thing as a general policy, if a credible case were brought to your attention or the division's attention of an American company hacking back against an attacker, would this really be a priority for you to prosecute? That's uh, an easier one for me to answer because National Security Division, it would not be a nation state or a terrorist, and so it would not be, not only not be a priority, it wouldn't be within the, the scope of the National Security Division, so an easy non-answer. Um, <laughs> the, the, the criminal division's uh, problem. I think the general issue that you raise is um, an important one, and there clearly be some uh, serious policy concerns about opening up a wild west where people could take self-help remedies, but within that vein, there's something called active defense that sometimes means hacking back, but sometimes means something else, and since we have a bunch of bright uh, scholars here, it's something to look at, which is 
right now in Han Solo of, did active defense at the bar. At the, <laughs> that was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> there should Sorry. be some foul or points deducted. For, yes. Uh, the um, but. Right now, I think you've heard Director Comey and Mueller use slightly different uh, formulations for the FBI, but the essence is every company has been hacked, and if you think you haven't been hacked, it's because you don't know it yet. And what they mean by that is if you're a major company, your systems have been breached and can be breached. But then there's a question as what occurs once they are inside your system, and what type of steps can you take to make it more difficult for the adversary to get what it is that they want, what you value the most. And there, within the contours of a company's system, I think there's room uh, for folks to do uh, more than they're doing, and that's where they're working in terms of uh, defense. And also sometimes, just like we do in the brick and mortar world, to work with the government to put information there that's deliberately false, that the bad guy gets, that then allows us to bring an action, and even if we don't ultimately bring an action, prevents them from getting something that would be of value to them. Great torts exam question, which now I can't use, of <laughs> um, putting the uh, plans to a car that in fact won't operate properly onto the server so that then the nation state steals it, builds it, and everybody crashes. <laughs> Mm, mm. If I could, I know yeah, uh, it's yeah. half choked, but th that's a serious area where, uh, for one of you, uh, perhaps more, to look at because that's, uh, as this world changes, I think that's what companies are wrestling with now. At what point are they triggering liability outside of the system for steps they take inside of it? Yes, and I imagine the uh, uh, Intel crim divide also becomes the Intel civil divide if the government, our government, becomes aware of a hacking at a major company do you tell that company, again, at the risk of uh, compromising what you know? Um, yes. Hi, I'm uh, Laurie. I'm a Neiman Fellow, and I'm a British journalist. Um, uh, in the UK, uh, they have recently announced plans for extremism disruption orders, which sounds similar to some of the things you were talking about, which um, they are orders which will focus on um, preventing the ideology of, uh, of extremism before it begins, and uh, specifically at a non-legal level, so people haven't broken the law, but they will be able to be, for example, preemptively banned from public speaking, preemptively banned from uh, using the internet. And since, uh, clearly, as you've said, information sharing is going on, I was wondering what you thought, uh, both in a US and an international context, about the ethics of this kind of approach when it comes to preventing people speaking about whatever their own politics may be, particularly in the United States, which has a much more rigorous stance on freedom of speech. One thing that's good about being in a classroom setting and getting reporters' questions is confidently not answering them in their entirety. Uh, but it's uh, the uh, what I'd say is this: that as we look, uh, I was talking earlier about the Global uh, Combating Terrorist Forum or GCTF, where you get to work with not just the the UK but a variety of different countries' legal systems, and obviously. Each, uh, many countries have drawn different lines than we have while trying to protect uh, uh, the same rights and liberties. They do it in different ways. And in the United States, I don't think there's anyone that has quite the equivalent to our First, uh, first Amendment and the jurisprudence that follows from it. So the way that we wrestle with the problem will inevitably be different than some of our counterparts. What they're trying to do, um, which would be how do you uh, take action before, it beca before they commit the act. I think Director Mueller tells a story about how when he was, he was newly um, sworn in as uh, director of the FBI, uh, the next, literally his first week, 9-11 happened. He went after uh, September 11th to brief uh, the president. And he walked through, uh, consistent with his training, his years as a prosecutor, and said, uh, <coughs> Here's the facts and the evidence. Here's what we know about the hijacker, and did a, a presentation, very tight. And then uh, the response from the president was, "Well, that's well good, but I'm not, I'm not interested. I mean, I'm interested, but, and uh, primarily in holding them accountable after the fact. I want to know what you're doing to prevent the next terrorist attack. And so, since then, the FBI has transformed to try to meet that challenge. One thing we do in the United States system that sometimes uh, uh, 
controversial, and the Attorney General just endorsed in a speech to Europe, is the use of undercover operations. And in the undercover operation, what the FBI will often do, consistent with our system and values, will say, let's say we have someone who's talking the talk of violent extremism, but we're not sure whether that's the uh, person who's going to take that act to actually provide material support to a particular terrorist group or commit a violent act um, here at home or abroad. And what they'll do is they'll provide that person the opportunity or supposed opportunity to do it and see whether they take the steps to follow through on their talk. If they do, then that falls within our criminal justice system. And if they don't, it does not. Um, within uh, uh, Britain, there were claims that Britain had been using some of the intelligence it gathered either to propagandize to be able to um, create fake information out there or it was credible about people they wanted to discredit or even uh, simply leaking information about uh, enemies, uh, would-be terrorists that they wanted to discredit within those terrorist communities. Within the U.S. context, is there law around that? Are there uh, uh, limits on, on that kind of activity were it to be conducted by the U.S.? I'm trying to, uh, I'm not sure I'm totally tracking the activity that yeah. you're, uh, but I'll say this in terms of countering violent extremism, there's um, an effort to, a lot of the, uh, it's very slick uh, propaganda campaigns being used through social media by some of these terrorist groups. And talking to professionals in this field, some of it looks like the same type of quality that we'd professionally produce. And so part of the discussion internationally and here at home has been, well, how do you counter that type yes. of messaging that makes it look like it's going to be you know, a Disney movie if you go over and join ISIL, when that is not, in fact, what's occurring when, when you get over to the Syria-Iraq region. And in the US, there's a part of the State Department that has worked on, and I think they're more interested in finding voices that can counter that narrative and figuring out a way to get them on to social media, but those are um, those are truly the people um, espousing. No, uh, I was those thinking mu much of the much more controversial example of here's somebody preaching hate, but not that anybody's going to arrest or something. Uh, through our intelligence sources, we come to something compromising about that person, and then choose to feed it to a reporter or something. That that kind of. Oh yeah, if that's uh, um, you, you could not do that with a a, a U.S. Um, person, if that's as the mean, target, you could, as a U.S. person, as the target of uh, uh, a, a campaign to and the the natural inverse to that statement. Then should I infer anything about no, a non-U.S. person? No, because that um, there is different. Um, a, our, our expertise would be more on the on the U.S. person um, uh -huh. uh, protections. Got it. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm Timothy Edgar. I'm a visiting fellow at Brown. Um, and I wanted to get back to the NSA for a second and ask you about FISA court and particularly about the FISA court opinions. Um, because up until just a few years ago, the only thing that was publicly known about the FISA court's process was just this bit raw number of this is the number of applications that have been sought and this is the number that have been granted. But and since Snowden especially, there's been an avalanche of declassified opinions, just a huge number of really detailed opinions that the administration has released, um, all sorts of detailed things about upstream collection, internet metadata collection, business records, things like that, that have been uh, re really quite a huge change. And I guess uh, the question I wanted to ask you is, how do you see this change affecting the work of the FISA court going forward? And especially since your attorneys kind of appear in front of the FISA court and have to deal with this. Um, do you see this becoming routine? Do we expect, you know, uh, uh, opinions will be released on a regular basis after having been declassified? Will this kind of transparency continue? Or is this more of a one-off in response to a big crisis involving the Snowden revelations? That's good. So I think the um, Director of Na National Intelligence and General Counsel for the, uh, the DNI have spoken on this uh, issue to say that there will be a regularized process to look at the opinions and attempt to declassify them. And it's consistent with the conversation we had before that uh, we should always try to get uh, out as best we can the legal uh, 
architecture if you can do so in a way that doesn't jeopardize sensitive sources and methods. There's probably more awareness now uh, when trying to write the opinion to try to do it in a way where you can segregate out the, um, the technical information that would reveal exactly how you're acquiring it or who it's being acquired from, from the legal principle. And as I was saying, um, and I know you're an expert on uh, uh, the law and technology, it can be very difficult in when, it's, when you're addressing a new type of technology because it is so integrally related to discussing those details. So uh, I'm not sure there's a cure-all where at the end of the day you don't come back to uh, a difficult decision about how much do you want to risk your ability to, to obtain the information versus the need to have the faith, confidence of the American people in what it is you're doing. Yeah, I, mean, I guess there's a distinction between greater transparency. Real transparency. quick, Tim, real quick. Right, right, right. And, and, and <laughs> That's all I was thinking. Got it. I, I just, I'm aware of the time, yeah. and I want to make sure we see uh, somebody on the question tool. Yeah. Maybe so if we do it just like a buy 60 minutes, get five to 10 free, would people find that a bonus they want? I, mean, I feel like we're on a real substantive role here. Yeah. I should ask our guest if that works for you too, or? Yep. Yeah, we Got have it. a little time. Kira. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a question from the question tool. Um, all right. Will there be a tangible consequence resulting from the indictment of the Chinese military hackers that you mentioned before, or is this largely a symbolic act? Um, <laughs> I'm waiting for it to be like, symbolic act. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so I'll say a couple things uh, in, in response to that, because you get that question uh, uh, fairly often. One, at the beginning of our uh, use of the criminal justice system against international narcotics kingpins, uh, there were many who said, why are you bringing criminal charges against these people? They're not inside the United States. You'll never see them here. And they've been here, and they've been tried, and many of them are incarcerated now. Uh, two, with the counterproliferation, and again, as I was saying at the beginning of the regime, there were individuals who were uh, abroad. Not every country was buying into the fact that this was uh, something against international norms. Subsequently, um, as recently as today, uh, we just secured a conviction against an individual named Alex Sai. Uh, and while the charges, uh, he, he's someone who is known to be a proliferator, proliferator. I'm stumbling over that word today, uh, but he and uh, was criminally charged for violating civil uh, regulations and he was obtained. He knew he was under uh, indictment. He knew the regulations applied to him, and yet he traveled uh, to Estonia where he was picked up and extradited to the United States. So <clears throat> when we use the criminal justice system it's with the intent of bringing them here with all the rights of due process that that entails to face their day in court. And uh, three, again, not doing this is effectively decriminalizing the activity and sending the wrong message if we want to have an international norm as we move uh, forward in an increasingly interconnected and digital world that is okay to uh, obtain information in this manner. And so I think it was important not to decriminalize this activity and use our system when the facts and evidence show that there's somebody accountable at the other end of that keyboard. Is it a fair part of the calculus in figuring out probably the prudential more than legal limits of our own uh, activities, either in offensive cyber stuff or in undertaking surveillance, um, whether there's a symmetry to it. Well, if the Chinese were doing this on our territory, we'd try to arrest them for it. We would indict them. Um, is it, how much does it factor in, well, that means we probably shouldn't do it ourselves or is there not that kind of symmetry at work? It's states do what states do, and we have our own reasons, and ours are noble, and maybe other states are less noble. I mean, how does that calculus work? That's a good question. I don't know how you're able to read the computer screen. That was, yeah, it was a, it's there. a 255 character limit, too. <laughs> uh, so I'd say in this case, um, this is something that the president has said uh, we do not and should not do, which is we should not be targeting private companies <clears throat> for the economic gain of our private companies. And one thing that's interesting in relation to that norm is every, almost every country in the world openly acknowledges having an intelligence service and that they're doing so for uh, national security reasons. And that's been true and recognized in international law uh, for years. 
there's no country in the world that openly acknowledges that they are stealing economic information for their economic uh, gain. And so to an extent um, outside of perhaps the halls here, um, I'm not sure there's anyone who's articulating that that should be a norm. So we shouldn't do it. And when we catch other And by economic, just to be clear, you mean tactical economic, to figure out what the sealed bid is on a Boeing uh, airliner bid and then to know to go a dollar less or something. Is that what you mean when you say economic? Yes, private uh, economic game or uh, stealing. Um, you're attempting to buy, in, in some of these instances, you're trying to buy a technology. And instead of purchasing it, um, you steal the same technology, and then you end up not completing that uh, transaction. Stealing that technology for the purpose of financial gain is what you're saying we wouldn't do. Yes. For the purposes of financial gain. <laughs> yes. Got it. <laughs> Nolan. Uh, my name is Nolan Bowie. Uh, I teach information policy courses at the Kennedy School of Government. I've been both a uh, state prosecutor, a federal special prosecutor, as well as running uh, public interest policy. <laughs> Um, one of the last questions that uh, John had asked me about concerns basically propaganda. I'd like to point out that the Fourth Army Group, Fort Bragg, engages in global psyops, which is another name for uh, propaganda, where the Department of Defense defines psyops as the use of words, messages, and images um, as weapons for warfare. So they do, by the change in attitude, they do engage actors and things like that. So my question legally available tools, and whether that includes uh, constitutional amendments of the First, Fourth, and the Fifth Amendments, in that I recognize that all national security uh, community members, including uh, officers in the Defense Department, all swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So when they have these conflicts, they're, they're not only legally, but ethical, and maybe reach uh, uh, the Nuremberg uh, standards of behavior. Um, after Snowden's uh, disclosure, along with WikiLeaks, it appears as though um, many have crossed that line in terms of uh, the legality, particularly of the Fourth Amendment. You mentioned that success um, in um, national security was prevention of a crime. At what point does this lead to uh, pre-crime intervention? And, and the use of uh, information before a crime is actually committed to basically uh, deny persons uh, rights that they would otherwise be entitled to. So, and that's what I was going to add a little bit, I think, into the other question. So in, in our system, um, uh, when you're using the, the criminal justice uh, uh, system as, as a tool to prevent a terrorist act, we do not uh, bring charges against someone for their views or beliefs. And so that's where I think the use of, uh, you'll see in our uh, system, the use of undercover operations where you will use the undercover operation to see whether the individual who's indicated um, a desire, uh, a belief in violent extremism or espouses views of a foreign terrorist organization, but you put to them the question of are they going to take the actual step? Are they going to uh, pull the trigger on what they think is a bazooka? Are they going to press the button on what they think is an explosive uh, device? And it's when they take those concrete steps that we have available criminal uh, charges. And as you know, as a former prosecutor, that gets put to its burden of proof by judges and defense attorneys. And to date, we have not uh, had someone successfully employ the entrapment defense when confronted with that type of evidence. And I think that shows the care uh, that the agents have used in uh, using what needs to be a carefully monitored tech uh, technique. I did want to, on one just broader, I think that uh, reasonable minds can and do differ over both the statutory interpretation of 215 uh, the, so the provision of the Patriot Act that was used to collect certain uh, metadata uh, telephone uh, records and also over the constitutionality uh, of it. And that will ultimately be a decision you know, for the courts uh, to decide. But when under our system you've 
appropriately submitted the information to a FISA court judge pursuant to the statute. The judge has ruled and granted uh, an order, and then it goes to the operational agency, or NSA, uh, to execute that order. I do think it's unfair to the professionals who have followed the system that we've set up, um, sought to comply with it, to brand them as somehow violating, which I'm not saying you were doing, but I have heard uh, folks do, violating their oath to protect the Constitution. They did what we uh, asked them to do in terms of following the appropriate procedures and briefing the relevant committees. It's up to us, and it's an important debate to have whether we think those are sufficient protections. But that's not a, that's not a rogue um, actor acting with bad intent. That's someone trying to follow um, the laws as our congressmen and senators have written them the best they can and as the courts have interpreted them. Well, we end on a note that we could surely continue on uh, at great length. But um, thank you all for the extra 10 minutes. I think it was actually well worth it. Um, Thank you, John, for coming up and talking to us. Thank you. Thanks for the questions.